My name is Neil and this is Real Terrain Hobbies and in this video we're going to make a massive 8 foot by 4 foot gaming board with a huge 8 foot river running straight through and I'm going to show you how you can turn all of this into this. Alright, so I know what you're thinking. This is an insanely and incredibly daunting task. Where do you even begin? Where do you even get started? I'm right there with you, but we're going to walk through this together and get this figured out. Alright, so never starting off a really big project like this, obviously the first thing you're going to need is a really solid foundation. And for that, I'm using 1 8 inch MDF particle board or 3 mils by 4 feet by 2 feet and I'm also using some cross bracing here. PL Premium is the glue I use and here is a quick shot of the tools all of which can be purchased over at realtrainhobbies.com slash shop. Alright but before we get any further with it it's time to talk about this video's amazing sponsor World Anvil. World Anvil is an amazing online world building platform designed for both writers and most importantly game masters and tabletop RPGers. It just started out as a set of tools that Demetrius made for his wife Janet and her tabletop campaign and since they've made it public it's exploded in popularity and they're quickly approaching 1 million users on their platform. What it brings to the table is a vast assortment of tools that allows the GM to build and link interactive maps, character sheets, history histories, governments, content trees, where everything in your world is interactive and links together. It can be as complex or as simple as you want it to be with questions and prompts to help you with fleshing out your world. The GM has full control of what each of your players sees and has access to. And finally, the look you present with your campaign is completely customizable with pre-baked themes or you can completely customize it yourself with CSS code. So be sure to go check them out and get started on your world and your campaign. Okay, so before I glue this down and uh, as I measured this up, I made sure to leave an eighth of an inch here. So there's a teeny tiny little gap right here. This end is not flush. And that is because this MDF board is exactly two by four feet. And if we add anything onto the sides, that's gonna give us an extra eighth of an inch here and an eighth of an inch there or six mils total. And you don't want that because in a certain configuration with these things, when you have the two long pieces side by side like this, and then one like that, it's actually gonna be making the two that are side by side greater than the one single two by four that's going that way. So instead of butting the edging up against the side here like this, we want it to sit on top. And that's why we have this little gap here. So very important. All right, so I'm installing some cross bracing here and this is gonna be stopping the table from warping and twisting. It's gonna give it some extra rigidity and I'm using PL Premium uh, to glue this down along with some finishing nails. Now we're gonna go with inch and a half star foam. So there is gonna be a little bit more bend than there would say with two inch foam. I want to go with an inch and a half just to make it a little less bulky. Uh, but there will be some added weight with that bracing in there, but it's not going to be too, too much. So now again, using the PL Premium to glue this stuff down works really well with the styrofoam and doesn't eat it at all. And uh, this is, again, this stuff is called liquid nails or no more nails, depending what part of the globe you're in. It's just a construction adhesive and it works perfect for this type of application. We are going with four boards. That's right. So this is going to be an eight foot long table by four feet. Each of these are two feet wide and four feet long. 
For these type of wargaming boards, uh, typically they go with a straight flat edge so the boards butt up nice and perfectly and you don't have to worry about the things mismatching. I wanted to mix things up, do things a little bit differently and put some hills in different variations on the sides. Now to do that, we got to do a lot of planning beforehand and make sure these are absolutely identical to each other. Okay, so I'm just working on the end piece here. Four pieces here again, so this is just for the river. The river boards, so there's two river boards. So these got to be identical. They all got to be identical obviously, but this side, this half needs to be identical with this half. So you can have the two boards come together this way and you can flip one and put it the other way as well. So like that. So I'm going to mark center, which I've got here. Now the rivers are going to have to meet in the center. So I'm going to mark it three inches that side and three inches that side. So that's going to give us a total of six inches. That's going to be the river mouth. That's how wide it's going to be. If you want these identical, your features have to be marked out and planned out perfectly. So I'm going to say two inches in, maybe we'll have a dip. Two inches on that this side. And then where we have our dips, so all the corner pieces have to end up the exact same height. So I'm going an inch and a half here, inch and a half there, and same with on the long ones too. And that way every board will end up uh, lining up on the corners no matter what orientation. And then wherever we have our dips and everything, they will have to be just exactly as low or the same height on this size as well. So yes, there's only going to be two river pieces, so just those two can butt up end to end and then the other two pieces are going to be designed where they can also butt up end to end as well. Now there still was some warping, but actually this gap here was mostly to do with my table. When I later moved these upstairs to my kitchen, uh, they did line up a lot better than they are here, but still I wanted to make it so that we could do something where these could lock in together. So I'm adding these blocks here and I'll be drilling those out and adding some dowels that can fit in in between the two and lock them securely into place. So now for the fun part where we actually start shaping out these boards and turning them into something uh, interesting. So I'm going to be using the hot wire cutters uh, for the rivers and for the hills and various things and you can see here where the rivers actually go through that cross bracing I notched it out with my Dremel tool and later on when we pour the resin it's going to add a bit of thickness to that joint right across there making it nice and solid once again. It's time to form these hills and what you typically use for that is a product called Sculpt Mold. It's got fibers mixed in with plaster and the fibers are there to help it make it lightweight. So I've been not able to find this stuff anywhere and I end up making it myself. So if, if you've seen my other videos, I use a product called Celluclay. I mix that with plaster, but that Celluclay is $50 for a tiny little bag. I forgot how expensive it was. So what I ended up doing was heading to the hardware store and I found this huge bag of blowing insulation for an eighth of the price of that little bag of Celluclay. And you get eighth of the price for easily eight times as much. Mix this with the plaster of Paris at a one to one ratio and it works amazingly well as a sculpt mold substitute. Moving on to the big hill board and this is where your armies are going to be kind of perched on top there overlooking the big battlefield down below and we're moving on to the rocks. Now for the stone typically what you've seen me do in the past is use rock molds with plaster. This go around I'm trying something different I used it on the last uh, video actually 
the diorama of that epic frost giant. If you haven't seen that video yet, go check it out. But the rocks I find using this stuff are, uh, turn out crazy realistic as you'll see and a little bit later as long as you properly blend things together with the sculpt mold uh, you can really turn these things into something really believable. Okay, so we are moving on to basing up these boards, getting rid of all that ugly white and turning this into something awesome. And this is what's gonna make the biggest difference or the big, a big drastic change anyway from what we had before. So I'm coating this entire thing in Mod Podge. This is gonna create a really nice hard protective shell over top of that plaster, which would be prone to chipping. And you'll see I'm adding sand here. I baked this beforehand. I was gonna do a different technique for the ground, but you'll see I kind of reverted back to my old ways. But here I'm using watered down Mod Podge on those stones to seal them up, or rather the, the wood. And now I'm just priming them with a burnt umber. And then also we're going to be needing some gravel, some small gravel. I just went outside, grabbed some of that, and we're going to use this for our riverbed. Now that is wood glue. I'm going to be painting over top of it so it doesn't really matter, but this is what I had on hand. And I'm sprinkling down the gravel, the loose gravel, and then also spraying it with isopropyl alcohol, which helps the glue to sort of surround those stones. Now we're moving on to painting the actual stone, the cedar uh, bark pieces. And I'm just starting off with a light gray on that. Then I went from there to a, sort of a beige color, sort of a lightish brown. And finally from there with a white dry brush. All right, so we are on to the vegetation, but first what you saw there for the ground texture was some tile grout I was using. I think it was three different colors for that. Uh, this is a method that kind of the railroader to people types use. I got this probably from Kathy Malott at some point. I like watching her stuff. And uh, yeah, so I'm actually using the same tile grout here on the road to form kind of tracks in the mud and in the dirt and uh, just using some different colors and things to blend it in. And then I spray it, wet it down and add on some watered down Mod Podge to really harden things up and make it nice and durable. All by myself. So I brought everything upstairs onto the kitchen table. But there we are. Time to uh, continue on upstairs where at least I got a bit of more daylight. Okay, so let's get this board finished up. We're getting really close. Getting real close. Gonna put some resin down in a bit. Yeah, it's gonna be good.
All right, so it's time for the most exciting yet daunting part of any build of this kind, and that is pouring the resin and creating that really nice realistic water effects. So this has the biggest potential to really turn your board into something incredible and just bring it up that extra notch or completely wreck and destroy all the work you've done. We just finished all that vegetation. But uh, first, before we get into it, what I'm doing here is just making some whitewater rapids using cotton and resin without any tint, and then we'll pour the resin on top. But as far as this getting wrecked by resin, if you know Jeremy from Black Magic Craft, he recently made a build using resin and his resin reacted on him. It, it didn't uh, react well with some water-based paint or color and it completely just foamed up and ruined the piece that he was working on. He was able to salvage some of it later, but what he had planned got completely destroyed. And yes, that's kind of at the back of my mind with this. I actually didn't even realize resin could react with certain types of paint. And, uh, but now you know, so do your research with your type of resin before mixing and pouring. But the resin I'm using is called Envirotex Light, and as you can see, I'm mixing with acrylics, so we'll see what happens. Okay, I've kind of thought of a new way of putting waves onto uh, the resin here. Normally what I do is I use Liquitex gel, and that uh, makes your little waves and your bumps and things. Uh, but I'm not a big fan of that, and it always seems to take away the shimmer, and it just... It looks really fake. I always love the really nice high, high gloss look of the resin itself. It looks looks like water. So what I decided to do, or kind of thought, was thinking how to do this. What I'm gonna do, it's close to curing now. It's got, I started it at five o'clock. It's about 8.30. It's got five, what does it say? Four to seven curing time at 70 degrees. So we're about 72, 73. What I'm gonna do, is tip it forward. So we'll do it this one right now. So we got three and a half hours. I'm gonna tip it forward just like that. And the gravity is gonna pull the water that way, but it's gonna be like, like kind of molasses running down a board. It's gonna kind of pool up and sort of bubble over. So it's gonna make a lot of really nice bumps in here. And I think it's gonna look really awesome. And not only that, where there's a rock, the water is gonna kind of push up on the rock too, and it's gonna be lower on the backside, which is realistically what would happen. So it might be a little bit early to do this now. It's a little dangerous. You could end up just sort of pushing the resin down to that end. I'm gonna leave it for maybe five minutes here, just give it a test run, see if it's getting, if it's a little too wet, still too runny. That's what we're gonna do. I'll let, put this one down too, and we'll see what happens. So here things are once uh, they're dry now. So you can see there's a lot more waviness in here than there would be otherwise. That would be completely flat like glass. I'm still debating whether to do more with it, but I really like that look. It, it really gives off, I don't know, it gives off more of a watery effect. I feel than throwing the Mod or the, uh, not Mod Podge, but um, Liquitex gel on top. So I'm kind of on the fence what to do with that. I'm even thinking of putting some paint down on here too, some white paint and stuff. But uh, let's take a look at the results down at this end here. So this is a side that, uh, this was the bottom of where we tipped the uh, panel over this way. It's down here at this end. So I was worried about things flowing down and building up over here. So there's just a bit of a lip. It's not really that bad at all. It's definitely uh, built up there as you can see. But what I'm going to do is take my angle grinder to that and grind it flush and then just put some uh, more resin on top just to make it nice and clear again just just like with my finger with a glove on. Of course on the other end over here there is a lot less resin so it even dips down. So I'm going to add more resin in here. I'm just going to pour, do another little pour there on both of these guys. Fill up that little dip which is totally fine. 
And uh, so that's gonna fix the two sides. And now we got some awesome ripply effects. I think this is really gonna do a lot more to kind of enhance the flow effect of this, these rivers. done this wargaming board it's complete man crazy crazy awesome yeah so this is a wargaming board and this is for war games atlantic uh they commissioned me to make this so if you don't know who they are go check them out in the link below and now it's time to ship this off to them i gotta crate this up in a big wooden crate and haul it off to the US or get somebody to haul it off. So traditionally war gaming boards are a little bit more flat so you can put buildings and things on. I did make some flat sections, particularly on this board. There's a bunch of flat sections. There's some spots over on there and on here too. And of course up on the big hill uh, to put buildings, trees, different props and things, different terrain. But I did make this one a bit more hilly than usual. Uh, this is also being used as a display board for them to take photographs of their different uh, products and things that they've got. So it was more of a mix between playability and aesthetics and beauty. That's why we got the uh, a lot of static grass put in here. Typically you don't use a static grass because you can't put units and things on there. So it's playable and it looks good. So extremely happy with this thing. This is eight feet, two feet by two feet by two feet by two feet eight feet long this is by far the biggest thing i've made we got the uh, tabletop world big board over there that was two pieces that was big but this is really big <laughs> so, so yeah quickly now i was challenged by a guy named beard clipper you know who you are andrew he's got a channel he's pretty new to the youtube space go check him out below He's making terrain and awesome uh, kind of hobby vlogs. But he nominated me to talk about why I love wargaming. Actually, to tell you the truth, I'm not a huge wargamer. He knows that, but he wanted to do this anyway. But I'll tell you why I want to get into wargaming. So this is a wargaming board. So what you do is you have big wars, big armies on either side and they come together and you have a big war, you roll dice, it's crazy. The, the rules and everything are really intricate. You, got, you have to use your line of sight and different obstacles in the way. Sorry, my mic is up over here, probably a little quiet. But you really, really use your terrain and it really affects the gameplay, how you roll dice, when you have cover, when you don't have cover. So that's war gaming. Typical war games are like Warhammer 40K is your big one. There's some World War II, World War I kind of style. There's uh, different eras, historical type war games. And then there's one called Middle Earth Strategy Battle Game, which is the one I want to get into. I like, I love fantasy. I love Lord of the Rings type stuff. So there you go, Andrew. That's why I want to get into war gaming and play on awesome terrain like this. But we'll get there at some point. So yeah, a big thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you guys want to help me and support the channel, support all of what I'm trying to do here and build this thing up, become a part of Real Terrain Hobbies. When you become a patron, you're becoming a part of the family, part of me and what I am doing and helping build this thing up and really making this into something epic and awesome and a big channel. And if you wanna be a part of that, go to my Patreon, become a patron member there for as little as $1 a month even, or you can do some higher tiers and get a little bit more involved that way. And we'd love to have you be a part of this and make it something to truly epic and amazing on the YouTube space. So big thanks to all my patrons already who are doing that and are a part of this awesome crazy experiment <laughs> make sure you go check out world anvil a big thank you to them again for sponsoring this video that's such a cool cool concept and platform what dimitri and his wife were able to make and it's going to completely revolutionize your dming and your player experience 
by joining up and building your world and your campaign over there.